<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Arbo, and I'm the senior publicist at Goose Lane Editions, Canada's oldest independent publisher based in Fredericton, New Brunswick. I am broadcasting tonight from the traditional unceded territories of the Wolastukie, Passamaquoddy, and Mi'kmaq people live in St. John, New Brunswick. For those watching live, if you would like to share with everyone where you are tuning in from, you may do so in the live chat, which depending on your device should be appearing somewhere nearby on the screen beside this video. I would first like to thank the Memorial University of Newfoundland English Department, and in particular, the Chair of the MUN Visiting Writers Committee, Lisa Moore, for co-hosting this wonderful event with us tonight and helping us bring this evening together. Next, I would like to thank you, our audience, for being here tonight and welcome you to the virtual launch of Constant Nobody by Michelle Butler Hallett. I have the book right here. Helping us celebrate this publication is a very special guest, Goose Lane author Tyler Enfield, whose novel, Like Rum Drunk Angels, was published just last spring. Over the course of the evening, as we enjoy readings and discussion, I would encourage everyone to enter any questions you may have for our authors tonight into the live chat. And as the evening will conclude with a short Q&A section with uh, questions coming from you, the audience, uh, any and all questions are um, encouraged and welcomed. I think we're all in for a wonderful treat tonight, and I'm thrilled to bring the evening uh, together by introducing our special guest, Tower Enfield. Tower Enfield is a writer, photographer, and film director broadcasting to us live from Edmonton, Alberta. He's the author of Matter Carmine and three young adult novels. He's the winner of the High Plains Book Award and a finalist for the City of Edmonton Book Award. His film Invisible World, produced by the NFB and co-written uh, with Madeleine Thien, is the winner of three Alberta Screen Awards, including Best Director. The novel he'll be reading from tonight, like Rum Drunk Angels, has been called an offbeat, slightly magical, entirely original retelling of Aladdin as an American Western. Cool Inquirer reviewed it as a surreal, often hilarious fracturing of the traditional Western tropes imbuing classic elements with a spirited postmodern awareness, like Rum Drunk Angels is a hoot with a tender heart at its core. It also, just this month, won the Western Writer of America's Spur Award for Best Traditional Novel. Please join me digitally in welcoming Tyler. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, that was a great introduction. Actually, it didn't leave much for me left to say. I think I'll just jump right into it. So I'm starting fairly early in the book. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of preamble needed. Uh, the protagonist's name is Francis Blackstone, and he's a boy who's fallen madly in love with the governor's daughter, and he will do anything to, uh, to um, get closer to her. So this is where it starts. It's the hour of night when the moon sits like a glowing rind upon the darkened window glass at the Hotel Whitmore's west face replicating itself in rows. Below, the saloon is buzzing with commotion and the odd celebrant stumbling out the swinging doors and onto the road upon which light opens and closes with the doors. Somewhere in there, a piano, also a guitar and singing. When nobody is about, young Francis Blackstone sneaks to the veranda. He scales the awning and from there climbs the facade to the uppermost tier where the governor and his family, and most importantly, the governor's daughter, reside for a month of leisure and adjournment each spring. Francis peeks through the window. Along the walls, a bureau and a nightstand, all the effects of a young lady, everything alive and flickering at a light of stub candles. Also the young lady herself, seated upon the canopy bed. She combs her hair before the mirror, more intent on the image than the combing. To Francis's dismay, she is still quite decent in a short sleeved blouse and a long blue skirt. A dozen times he stood before this sill, peering through her window, and a dozen times that same white blouse just waiting to confound him. What are the odds? But really, he loves the blouse. He loves the blouse because it's hers, because it touches her, and knows her body in a way he can barely fathom. And so he despises the blouse too, 
Of course he despises it. A youth's tenderest feelings are always conundrums. They're dream world animals leaping about, babbling in strange tongues. No one can make any sense of them, least of all a boy. Francis once stole a pair of her Sunday shoes just to smell them. Presently, the girl's hairbrush hits the floor with a bang. She stands in surprise. Who are you? What are you doing here? Francis is equally surprised to discover he has dropped down through her window and is now standing before her. He had no intention of doing so, and yet here he is, staring back, mute with awe. I said, what are you doing here? This is my bedroom. For lack of an answer, for any real sort of plan, Francis fumbles in his satchel. Here, he says, I guess I want to give you back these. The girl looks at the patent leather shoes in her outstretched hand. She takes them slowly. She studies their laces, their eyelets, their soles, as though she has never seen these or any other shoe before in her life. I don't understand, she says. Me either, says Francis, shrugging with bewilderment, because this isn't at all how he imagined their first meeting would go, not even close. He can't believe how much better it is. But who are you, asked the girl. Francis, he says, I'm Francis Blackstone. When this fails to register, he adds, my name may not mean much yet, but someday you'll remember this as the night we met. The girl blinks in surprise. She stares a moment and then carefully, slowly, sits down on the edge of the bed. What an odd thing to say. You standing here like I know you. All right, granted, he says. So how about this? I know you love to read books about outlaws and angels, and your favorite candy is butterscotch. I know on cool evenings you stroll through town with your mother. You stop at Landry's on the way home for vegetables. The girl's bafflement deepens. There's more, he says. I know you don't like to go to church, but you read the Bible on your own. I know you own three hairbrushes, but only use the one right there on the floor. And I know your moods, all of them, by the way a ribbon holds up your hair or pulls it back in a ponytail. How do you know all this? For the first time, Francis's embarrassment shows a little. I've been watching you. For a long time, I've been watching. Unexpectedly, the girl smirks in delight. You have not. Francis says nothing. Watching me. Well, if that is meant to impress me, I'm not impressed. Why are you smiling? Nothing. And stop smiling. All right, he says. She pulls out a bit of fuzz on the bedspread. So where have you seen me? Thought you weren't impressed, he says. She smiles, though her face has gone red. There's a big difference between curiosity and I am hands down, flat out in love with you. Do you understand? I'm a goner. That's why I'm here right now, to tell you that. And also to give back those shoes. The look on her face says she recognizes flattery when she hears it and can perhaps tolerate a bit more. She waits. When it's clear no poetry is forthcoming, she narrows her eyes. But how old are you? Doesn't matter, he says. We're going to be together a long time. Just tell me, she says. 14. Me too, she says. I'm 14 too. I know that, says Francis. I know just about everything about you, except probably your name. She appears to think on this, as in really considers him this time. She says love is a start, but without money, her father will never consent to courtship. Plus, Francis is a rogue. That's all fine, he says. It is not fine. I mean it. My father is Governor Whitmore. He owns everything, his hotel, everything. He won't allow some poor nobody to come sweep me away. Then I'll find money. Just like that, she says. Just like that, he says. Francis promises to return with money. There is no obstacle, he says, that can impede his heart and the pledge he now makes to her. He asks for a token of her commitment to keep him going. What kind of token? Let me see them. She laughs in surprise. Did you say? Yes, I did. She regards him a while, incredulity plain upon her face. You are something else, you know that? I suppose this is your idea of gallantry? Maybe. And had you asked for a small kiss, I might have even considered it. I say never start small, he says, with anything. The girl opens her mouth with yet another retort and hesitates. Francis just looks at her. She looks back. A subtle something ripples through the air. Call it a pinkness. She says, well, that's just silly. Why would I do such a thing? Francis looks at her. She looks back. They look at each other. Anyhow, it's you who wants a peek, and you haven't given me one good reason. After a long, lovely moment, Francis lifts his chin, 
tiniest of gestures. Still meeting his gaze, she unbuttons her white blouse, bottom to top. She then opens its sides, revealing to Francis what lies beneath. What does Francis see? Space, time, the harmony of the planets. He's destroyed, he's inspired, he's confounded beyond all account. The girl is visibly shy, but no less engaged than he. A tremulous magic then, a shared wonder. He watches her and her eyes never leave his. A noise in the hall, just beyond the door. She gasps and twists away to button her blouse and Francis is out the window to the road, running, running. He's never run so fast. He doesn't know where he is going, though he's firm in the belief that speed is somehow necessary. Everything is imperative. There is no time to lose. He is lost and clueless and utterly alive, while across his face, tears of glory. That's it for the reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. That was uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, so I think now we'll move on to the next portion. Uh, next, I would like to introduce you to Michelle Butler Hallett, whose novel Constant Nobody, which I have right here, hit shelves this month and whose release we are here today to celebrate. Michelle Butler Hallett is the author of five novels, including her second most recent, uh, This Marlowe, which was nominated for both the Relit Award and the Dublin International Literary Award. She has a long-standing interest in Russian history and culture, studying these subjects while an undergraduate at Carleton University. She lives and is broadcasting tonight from St. John's, Newfoundland. The time is 1937 and the place is Basque County, embroiled in the Spanish Civil War. This is where constant nobody takes us in this thrilling story of espionage, complicity, love, tyranny, and identity. Uh, I just want to say a few words about the book before we begin, or, or share a few words that our people have shared about the book. Um, of Constant Nobody author Christine Fisher Guy says, with vivid characters and indelible images that transmit the cruel bleakness of Stalin's Russia and the ruthless gentility of Chamberlain's England, Butler Howard conjures a morally complex world of high stakes international espionage where nothing is as it seems except that the human heart wants what it wants. In Constant Nobody, Michelle Butler Hallett gives us a spy thriller that does more than entertain. It asks us to meditate on the fundamental questions of existence. Who can we trust and what should we believe? I, I would also just like to share one more uh, uh, selection of words, uh, this time from author Amy McKay, who uh, endorsed the book on the back. Um, she had this to say about the novel. Constant Nobody is a suspenseful work of historical fiction populated with nesting dolls of intrigue, identity, and revelation. Set on the murky borders of war and political unrest, Constant Nobody is a powerful reminder of the importance of connection, one person to another, no matter the cost. Please join me digitally in welcoming Michelle Butler Hallett. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, we are in northern Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Polyglot Temerity West is an intelligence agent. She works for the British Secret Intelligence Service. Now, Britain is not officially involved in the Spanish Civil War, though they are trying to keep an eye on things in their usual imperial manner. Kostya works for NKVD, the Soviet Secret Police. Also a polyglot, Kostya is in Spain with other NKVD agents hunting down members of a rogue communist faction called POUM. And this is happening despite the fact that USSR is officially on the side of the communists and the Republicans and allegedly supporting them against Franco's fascists. Seeking POUM member Dr. Cristobal Zapatero, though in need of medical attention first, Kostya checks an international red aid clinic not far from Garak Heights, where Temerity is undercover as British nurse Mildred Ferngate. Uh, initially, they're both speaking in Spanish. Kostya has said his name is Tijon. Uh, Temerity is trying to treat Kostya's abscessed toe. She is not a nurse. Pinching a lance between finger and thumb, Temerity knelt before him. Now, 
Let me see that abscess. He studied her trousers, how they flowed off her waist yet clung to her thighs. A small object bulged in her right pocket, a folding knife perhaps. To his surprise, he felt at once proud and protective of her. She could look after herself, it seemed, yet she was so small. Reminding himself this woman was his enemy, he looked to the lance. Will it hurt? Only if you laugh. Hand near her shoulder, she held the lance as though hoisting a tiny harpoon and hesitated. Smirking, of course, she spoke in English. An indecisive Britisher. But don't look so surprised. I speak seven languages. English is not your strongest, then. He resumed speaking Spanish. Apparently not. I could cut that accent with a knife and fork. English is an ugly language, hardly worth the effort. Oh, nonsense. A poet can make English sing. Listen. Take all my loves, my love, yea, take them all. What hast thou then more than thou hadst before? No love, my love, that thou mayest true love call. All mine was thine before that. Well, you get the point. No, please, finish it. Temerity almost smiled. Perhaps Tihon hadn't lied. Perhaps he really was a journalist and not an enemy. Very well. All mine was thine before thou hadst this more. Then, if for my love thou my love receivest, I cannot blame thee for my love thou usest. But yet be blamed if thou this self deceivest by willful taste of what thyself refusest. I do forgive thy robbery, gentle thief, although thou steal thee all my poverty. And yet love knows it is a greater grief to bear love's wrong than hate's known injury. Lascivious grace, in whom all ill will shows, kill me with spites, yet we must not be foes. The silence between them felt suffocating. Then temerity sounded brisk again. Shakespeare, Sonnet 40, now lie back. I'll get beside you and lean over your legs so you don't kick me. Unsure what else to do, Kostya lay on the ground. The press of belly and breasts on his legs startled him. Is this really the best way? Little pinch. He swore in Russian. Fucked in the mouth. She knelt up and wiped away wad after wad of bloodied pus. You Russians have the best profanity. You speak Russian? Oh, I had to show off, didn't I? She continued in Spanish. I hardly need to speak the language to understand that you just said something foul, but yes, I've picked up a few words. Hold still. She manipulated the abscess, squeezing out the last of the visible pus. Kostya hissed and winced. All right, Tihon, I've got about as much of this corruption as I can manage. Epsom salts will draw out the rest. Then we can see about rooting out that nail. For now, I want you to sit up, lean against the wall there, yes, well done, and soak your foot. Confused, pained, charmed, he could say nothing. Okay, we're going to move ahead a bit now to uh, the 10th of June in 1937. This is taking place in Moscow. Uh, five days before in Moscow, after meeting again by a series of weird accidents, Kostya removed Temerity from a very dangerous situation and brought her to his flat, where she's now hiding. Given that Kostya is a serving NKBD officer and that Temerity is a British intelligent agent and that Kostya knows this, his decision here is um, problematic. So add to that the small matter of the Great Purge on the go, when anyone might be arrested at any time, NKBD preferring to carry out raids in the middle of the night, 
Uh, Moscow has a housing shortage. Kostya is, by arrangement of his surrogate father, NKVD officer Major Arkady Balakarev, sharing a flat with one Dr. Yefim Sherba. Arkady compels Yefim to do many things against his conscience and better judgment. One of them is to discreetly treat Kostya's badly injured arm with morphine so Kostya can keep working. Yefim is very suspicious of this woman called Nadia that Kostya has brought to live in the flat. The night Kostya brought Temerity to the flat, they were both impaired, Kostya with morphine and alcohol, Temerity by a forced injection. They sneaked past the sleeping watchwoman in the lobby, one Yelena Tikhonova Petrovna. Temerity stumbled in the lobby, and somewhere between there and Kostya's sixth floor flat, she lost her shoes. Neither Kostya nor Temerity has any idea what happened to the shoes. Uncertain what woke him, Kostya checked his watch. 17 minutes after two in the morning. Five bangs of a fist. Comrade, open the door. Oh, shit. He felt the floor beneath his feet before he understood he'd gotten out of bed. Yefim in the room next door cried out in fright. In the front room, the chair scraped against the floor as Temerity stood up. Kostya grabbed his keys and identification wallet from the side table and his robe from the closet. In the hallway, he discovered that he'd taken his uniform tunic instead. Oh, Nadja, I'm sorry. Five more bangs. Open the door, comrade. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Kostya hauled the tunic over his head, blinding himself to the sight of temerity standing behind the chair. He lurched to the door and pressed his ear to the hinge to listen. He thought he recognized the voice. Comrade Yaroslav, at once, please. We've no wish to wake your neighbors. A second man spoke. Katelnikov, listen to me. We're on the wrong floor. That's the wrong flat. They're all numbered the same in this building. Oh, fuck. You'll be fucked if we don't make quota. Kostya unlocked the door and stepped into the dirty light of one hanging bulb. Katelnikov? Matvey Katelnikov whirled round, faced the man who called his name. I, oh no. Nodding to Matvey and then to his partner, Kostya showed his ID. Can I be of any help? A third officer ascended the stairs, his voice stiff with embarrassment. Nikto, is that you? Kostya recognized the third officer, an older sergeant and one of his department colleagues, not that he could remember his name. So many new men. Dobrynian, right. Good morning, Dobrynian. Dobrynian squinted at Kostya's tunic and undershorts. Light sleeper? When fellow officers beat on my door, yes. Matvey gave a little cry. Then he cleared his throat. <clears throat> the numbers on the door are all the same on each floor. We're, uh, we're on the wrong floor. An accident, Comrade Sergeant Dobrynina. Simple oversight. A simple idiot. Who's on your list? Yaroslav Nikolai Edwardovich, fifth floor, flat number seven. Then go directly below to the fifth floor, flat number seven, and arrest Yaroslav. Yes, comrade sergeant. Dobrynian turned on the second officer. And you, find the other one. What, Petrovna, Elena Tikhonova. Comrade, a senior lieutenant Nikno, Nikto, permit me to show you the list. Now, which flat is Petrovna's? Kostya felt dizzy. This floor, flat number two, down the hall. She's very old. I have no idea how she manages the stairs. There, you see? Comrade Senior Lieutenant Nikto can read the list just fine, and we woke him up out of a sound sleep. So the problem is not with the list. 
as the second officer found Yelena's flat and beat on the door. Dobrynin offered Kostya a cigarette and matches. Kostya lit the cigarette and took a deep drag. Puppies. Dobrynin nodded. Once we're back at Lubyanka, I'll kick them up the arse. Hmm. Telephone directories and flower sacks, yes? Leaves no mark, so the boys will look fit for duty. They both chuckled and wished each other a good night. As Kostya retreated into the flat and locked the door, the arresting officer called Yelena's name. Yefim and Temerity stood near the kitchen at the end of the corridor to the door. Temerity wearing Kostya's pajamas and clutching Turgenev's father's and son to her chest. Yefim fully dressed and carrying a small suitcase. Yefim whispered, are they gone? Kostya's laugh, quick and rough, sounded more like the yelp of a dog. Not yet. Down the hall, Yelena screeched her protest, her loyalty to the party. I can prove it, comrade, these shoes. Temerity dropped the book. Kostya and Yefim flinched, but kept quiet. Matvey ran back up the stairs. Do you need help? Dobrynian sounded amused. Shoes, grandmother? The witch who lost these shoes cringes here. I saw her. Senile old sow. Matvey disagreed. With respect, comrade sergeant, take a look at these shoes, this lettering inside them. I think that's English. Kostya stared at Temerity. He couldn't speak. Yefim saw this and shut his eyes. Dobrynian's voice approached the door. Nikto knows languages. I'll get him. Cigarette gone to ash. Kostya waved Temerity and Yefim away, pointing to the bedrooms. They kept still. Matvey almost shouted, no, no, please don't disturb him again. You timid little rabbit. What, are you in love with him? Don't want to upset his beauty sleep. No, wait, Yelena's voice rang out. Yosef Vissarionovich! Temerity stepped close enough to Kostya to whisper. She calls on Stalin? Kostya nodded. Yosef Vissarionovich, help me, help me, I am loyal to you. Yosef Vissarionovich, hear my prayer. Yosef. A heavy thud. Dobrynian laughed. Pistol whipping old ladies, Katelnikov. Nobody's rabbit now. Get her into the car. Men grunted, feet dragged. After some noisy difficulty on the stairs, Kostya guessing that they allowed the unconscious woman to roll. Dobrynin returned to the fifth floor to collect Yaroslav. The NKVD car departed. Yefim felt much of the tension leave his body, yet even this relief corroded him, scarring his thoughts and feelings as much as the shrapnel had scarred Kostya's shoulder. Not me, not me, not me. Thank you. Wow, how great was that? Um, thank you so much, Michelle, for that reading. Um, I was just checking uh, the, the, the chat actually right at the end and someone just wrote brilliant comedy. And I think I have to agree, it's such a treat to hear the, the characters and to hear the dialogue come alive in this format, a reading. Thank which, you. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I think from here, uh, I will hand things over now to Lisa Moore. Uh, Lisa Moore is the chair of the Mon Visiting Writers Committee. And uh, Lisa, you can um, usher in the discussion portion of the evening and uh, take it from there. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you both uh, 
Michelle and Tyler for those beautiful readings. My gosh, they're completely riveting and the books are fantastic. Um, so witty and uh, charming and in some cases gruesome um, and, and beautiful. Um, um, it's interesting that you both had shoes in your readings. I guess that was a bit of a, a synchronicity, wild synchronicity. Hmm. Um, I'm going to take a moment to uh, just uh, plug, if I may, a, a, an event that's happening at uh, Memorial in the English department. Uh, we have a, the visiting writer, Sharon Bala at Memorial, and she's going to be doing on April 8th, uh, which is a Thursday from 7 to 9 p.m., a masterclass in writing, which everybody is welcome to, and it's free. It's called The Art of the Revision. So anybody who has a story or a novel that they're getting close to the end of, and uh, although you don't have to bring it, you don't have to be at the end, you can work it with, she'll, she'll talk about uh, revision. And that's on April 8th. And if you go to the English department website, you can find out how to register. And there's also going to be a session on April 15th, which is um, restricted to people of color. Uh, it's a salon, a virtual salon for people of color and uh, it's in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I think that's really exciting too. Um, uh, I want, to, I want to just say thank you so much for including me, but also for these beautiful readings. It was just tremendous. I know you guys are going to have a, a conversation now, and I'm dying to hear. I know you're going to talk about writing and maybe genre fiction and hopefully everything else. So let's hear it. Thanks for the cue. <laughs> Michelle, I'm so glad you read that chapter. That was one of my favorites when Kitelnikov uh, goes to the wrong door. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel like the whole story is like a secret window into a Stalin era of Moscow, 1937, complete with British Soviet espionage. But it's also a pretty complex romance that explores ideas of love and duty and the consequences of choice. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on genre and where a story is, is varied and, and uh, full spectrum is this would, how would that fall into a category? What are your thoughts about that? I like to think of this and my last novel, The Smarlow, as a genre hybrid. If somebody wants, gets into it because they're interested in spy fiction, great. If somebody else gets into it because they're interested in it being feminist fiction, fantastic. Um, somebody wants, likes a historical um, angle, beautiful. Where I get concerned is if I get pigeonholed into something. And uh, uh, because I, I, I feel, I, I, I want my fiction to be, um, well, I want it to be complex and I want it to be packed full of questions. I don't particularly want to fit easily into a category, which, um, which may not make me terribly easy to market, um, but I'm I'm happy to be in in various categories. As I say, as, as so long as I don't feel like I'm trapped there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more categories that your book falls under, uh, the more laps it's going to land in. Hmm. I hope so. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't really change, does it? It's just sort of a label. But with that label, as you say, you can uh, you can attract people who are interested in spy people interested in romance, I think, also historical fiction, anyone who's got an interest particularly in, I think, um, uh, rush, rich period Russian literature is probably going to be very interested in your work as well. So it almost, you could say, uh, it benefits us to have uh, a broad range of, um, of genres that it could fall into. Thank you. Do you think about that beforehand when you create your story? Uh, probably not consciously. Um, I, I do read a lot of history and I'll, I'll get ideas here and there. What I'm, what I try to do is figure out what the story needs and give it that. And if it needs, um, if it needs some tropes of, of spy fiction, because I'm dealing with people who work in espionage, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll use them. Um, for, for example, neither Constant Nobody nor this Marlowe needed tropes of crime fiction, so I wouldn't have used those. Um, I, 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 I know, I don't, I don't think I consciously th think about it. It's, it's something I'm often thinking about afterwards when, when it's time to, okay, how are we going to market this? How are we going to pitch this place and the other place? Right. 
Yeah. Um, something else that was very interesting to me is that you have you have two protagonists, mm -hmm. Kostya, who is male. You've got Temerity, who's clearly female. And you've also got quite a large cast of male characters. And some of them, I would say, demonstrate what we would call today masculine toxicity or toxic masculinity. For sure. Um, and yet it seems that you've you've chosen to focus primarily on the, on the male view, mostly Kostya's perspective. I'm curious what drew you to write more from, uh, from Kostya's perspective than Temerity's. I'm not entirely sure I do focus m mostly on, on, on Kostya. Um, he does have a more conflicted nature for sure. Uh, he's, he's got more, um, more in, in inner conflicts going on. Temerity is much more certain about uh, what her duty is, how she's going to live up to it as is where her conf conflict is. Um, the toxic masculinity is a great observation. I'm really glad you mentioned that because uh, I would argue that toxic masculinity and the extremes of patriarchy are very harmful to everyone, men and boys included. And that uh, toxic masculinity taken to its extremes in which you're jockeying for, you're jockeying for power um, can easily lead to a tyrannical setup. One of the things that uh, Kostya has been trained to do is turn off his empathy, any sense of connection with other people. You can't kill people until you've dehumanized them, until you've, you've decided they're, they're somehow less important than you. And of course, he can't completely turn off his feelings, which is where a lot of his inner, inner conflict is coming from. I really wanted to do um, two protagonists in this one versus the traditional main, main character and, and supporting character. And in some ways, I think Temerity might be a bit of a stealth protagonist. What I'm hearing from other women is, uh, oh, well, I'm really into Temerity. I'm so glad you focused on her. And what I'm hearing from guys is, wow, you've really focused on Kostya. That, I'm finding that fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm actually glad you brought up um, the conflict too, because that was also pretty fascinating. Um, Kostya is a very complex character. Thank you. He was, he was groomed from a very young age to be an instrument of the state, basically the, the Russian machine, which is not a very pretty machine. Mm. And, um, and he's basically, uh, he, he's designed to carry out their agenda, which he essentially does, but he hasn't really bought into the narrative. He seems to be simply doing it, but he's, he's got a whole other side of himself as if he's been compartmentalized, which he mm -hmm. needs to do in order to empathize with Temerity, right, whom he's fallen in love with. So what was that like creating a character who was so deeply conflicted uh, from beginning to end and, and not just in his work, but also in his relationship with Temerity. Exhausting and very satisfying. In a very early version of this, um, he was much more of a straight up uh, psychopath. And I realized that that was, that was kind of boring. And I'm interested in, I'm not in, at all interested in trying to apologize for anything Kostya or any real life NKBD agent has done. I can't, I just, it's appalling, it's, it's evil, it's terrible. What I'm interested in is why Kostya does the things he does. Um, a tyranny functions by tyrannizing, uh, by tyrannizing the very people who support it. If he steps out of line, he knows perfectly well he's going to end up shot in the basement of Lubyanka. Mm -hmm. So um, he feels in many ways he doesn't have a choice, but as, as he gets, as his emotions rise m more and more, he's recognizing that he, he does not want to do this. He cannot do this anymore. What's, what are his options? Yeah, they're pretty limited. And, um, and then the conflict arises in that he has to actually betray um, this life that he's been designed to carry out in order to take care of Temerity. Um, which brings in the, the whole romance side of it, which is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a beautiful way of, I think, humanizing Kostya's character is by incorporating uh, this sort of burgeoning love. And love seems to be something very new for him. He's, he's almost kind of like a child on a bicycle for the first time. It looks like he's going to fall over at any moment, uh, but he, he kind of finds his way little by little. And by the end, uh, maybe I shouldn't speak of the end, but um, yeah, I, I would say it was, it was very touching to see uh, him grow and explore kind of finding the walls uh, and like, like a blind person for the first time really exploring a room because he didn't seem to have any any real experience in love it certainly didn't come to him early in life and then here he is for the first time um, really moving in love with temerity thank you what what inspired the relationship between the two hmm 
I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Just that uh, I, I had this. Uh, I came across the story of Unity Mitford, who was an upper class uh, young British woman who in 1939, um, actually it was a bit earlier, she was an absolute fascist. She was an outright Nazi. And she moved to Berlin to do, uh, to, to study language and essentially stalk Hitler. She, I, she did this. Unity was six feet tall, very fair, blue eyed, this absolute Aryan goddess. Of course, Hitler noticed her and eventually she became part of his entourage. She was actually on the stage at the Nuremberg rally. And she's, um, I think this started for her as a very childish way to shock people, but she sort of realized, oh, hey, I kind of like this. It's, she's a repellent, repellent human being. Uh, when Britain declared war on Germany, she was so distraught, the story goes, that she shot herself in the head with, her 20, with a 22, survived. And uh, Hitler himself paid for her medical bills, paid for her passage back home. There is very short footage of her landing. She doesn't look terribly injured. I find that really interesting. Um, so I was a bit love when I was looking at her. I'm thinking, well, why on earth did she do what? Um, what why on earth would she do take such a drastic action? In no way could I make Unity interesting or sympathetic, and I certainly had no interest in doing so. So I kind of flipped her and said, okay, what would be what might be an anti-Unity? So take Nazi Germany. Let's go for Stalinist Russia. And that's kind of how. That's kind of where it's temerity came from. Um, the fact that the two of them are polyglots and deep down probably don't want to be doing what they're doing. That's that's really a common ground for them. And uh, the romance just kind of evolved from there. Good. Yeah. And then uh, just another personal curiosity, because they are both polyglots. Mm -hmm. uh, do you speak more than one language? Mm. I can limp along in French. I've lost. I'm I'm really out of practice. I wish I could. Okay. I had a dear friend and mentor uh, when I was at Carleton University who was one of these natural polyglots. He could pick up a language um, fairly quickly, self-taught, and was uh, interested in translation. Um, and he seemed to think everybody could do it. So that's what that's how I got interested in that. Yeah, it was a very interesting uh, little sort of niche that they fell into because um, obviously we don't know many polyglots, but I think they each spoke about seven languages. Um. Mm -hmm. each, roughly. Yeah, that was, that was quite interesting. Um, and then another thing that I noticed was uh, I mean, the, the time, the period was a very interesting period, uh, 1937, uh, just before World War II, but just after the Spanish flu. And you actually, you refer to the Spanish flu a couple of times, Kostya suffered from it. And Temerity, she had some relationship to it too, didn't she? Did she have family who was affected? I don't remember. Uh, Temerity had flu as a child and, and her mother and brother died of it. Okay. That's a, a great, um, th that pandemic was a huge, huge disruptive force, much like the one we're, we're living through. And that gives Costa and Temerity a very important point in common where they can start to empathize with, uh, with each other. Okay. So that was brought in as a sort of way for them to find each other mm -hmm. on the common ground. I was wondering if maybe you had, um, you had, uh, maybe in a later draft after COVID hit, introduced this to make it more relevant to today? Was it- was No, it, was there it, from the get-go. It was I always- want to, I wanna interrupt uh, if I can, mm -hmm. because we do have a few questions from the audience. Okay. Um, um, is that okay? <laughs> you yes, you were doing pretty good on your own. Uh, but I see here that uh, Trudy Morgan Cole uh, is asking the question, um, Temerity is such a wonderful name for your character. What inspired you to give her that name? And I, of course, am wondering that too. <laughs> um, in part, it's the uh, the response to to Unity Mitford. Uh, up up the upper the British upper class were giving their children very unusual names at that point in history, and Temerity's mother is also Russian, so she just likes the sound of it. Uh, Temerity's rather embarrassed by her name, and she's called Temmy growing up. So that's um, that's where that came from. Um, and then we have uh, from Marion Lockheed. Um, first of all, she says, Michelle, that your necklace is amazing. Oh. <laughs> okay. And then she asks, um, for your research, do you take a deep dive or are you more a uh, grab what you need uh, and run with it type? Oh, deep dive for sure. It takes me years to uh, to research a novel. Yeah, and I think when we were talking earlier uh, off off screen, uh, Tyler was mentioning just how how much uh, detail there is in this in this story, and how much uh, veracity of of setting and all that stuff. And 
And there's another question here um, from uh, Megan Laper. Uh, what should uh, what should or what does come first in your writing, the story or the setting? Uh, probably the story. Um, although it's, that's a tangly question because I often get my ideas from reading history, which and of course the the stories are in very you know things which really happened. As with um, with with much of this Marlowe, it has a very specific setting. I no, I'd have to say it's both at once. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to pull those things apart, isn't it? Mm. Um, I just want to say, I have a question of my own, but I just want to say uh, for anybody who's watching, I bought both of these books at goostlane.com and they came like that. And I got uh, emails uh, along the way saying, you know, this is where your book is, your book will be there then. And, you know, I'm reading your book will be there now. And I go and open the, the mailbox and it's there. So if, if you want to get these books, that is a great way to do it, uh, goostlane.com. But of course, uh, both of these books will be in your local bookstore and also at Chapters Indigo and probably the A word, <laughs> but uh, I, I really recommend getting it th through Goose Lane because as I said, it was just so quick and fast and easy. Um, I wanna ask you both about feminism in your books. Okay. Is it there? <laughs> Tyler, you go first. Um, my answer would be pretty brief. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a dominant narrative for my story. And, you, and your character, your female character is not a feminist. She seems quite um, independent and, and aware of herself. She's strong-willed, she's independent, and she's intelligent. So if that defines a feminist, then yes. But I wouldn't yeah. say it was a conscious motive. Um, I just wanted to cre create a great character. Yeah, and she- Somebody she who people could relate to and wanted to, to, wanted to, to, um, to empathize with. Thank you. And you, Michelle? Oh, yes. Yep. Um, it's um, on, on the surface that uh, temerity is working in intelligence in the field at all is, is a big deal. Um, she, is, uh, she is quite independent and also, as a, 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 I touched on earlier, she's a bit of a stealth protagonist. I mean, at the, one of the questions I really hope, hope this, this novel get, it inspires people to ask is, who is the main character here anyway? Yeah, and and we heard uh, there was there was a lot of wonder about that. Um, there's a question from James M. Fisher mm -hmm. uh, from Miramichi Reader who asks, "Can you comment again on your use of quotation marks or lack thereof?" <laughs> I punctuate dialogue with the M dash. Uh, I've learned that that's called the continental style. It's used uh, very much in Europe and Russia in non-English speaking countries. I stole it from an American novelist called William Gaddis. My, it's in my very first piece of public uh, of published uh, fiction. And I like it because I use the M dash and I don't use a lot of dialogue tags. I added a few when I was reading this evening uh, because it forces me to write the dialogue to, re to really concentrate on the character's voice and to um, and to show as, as, as much as I can. So it's kind of a disciplined thing for me and I've, I've gotten to really like it. And um, yeah. Um, I think Hemingway also used the M dash. Did he really? I think he did. Huh. Uh, there, there's another question from Marion mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, for Michelle and Tyler both. How do you stay motivated when working on a long piece of fiction? I'd love to hear about your respective processes in general. That's a great question. Go How ahead. long did it take you guys to write these? And yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Um. I think it was uh, about five months for the first draft and then maybe a year and a half for the remaining drafts. So the initial part came through pretty quick and then went through a number of transformations based on feedback I was getting from, from good people. Um, but as far as staying with it, uh, for me, I, I just write when I love it. I, like I, I really love to write and when, I, when I'm in it, it's something that I genuinely enjoy. And so it's a difficult question for me to sort of relate to in that regard. Um, I think I think if I didn't enjoy it so much, then it would be pretty challenging. But I just do it because I like it. And if I didn't like it, I would stop. I think in the piece that you read, uh, that was really clear. Like there was so much um, 
playfulness and mm -hmm. and feeling in it i think i could feel that you must have been having a good time writing it yeah. what, what do, about you I genuinely enjoy it and um i would say that uh it, it's an amusement it's an amusement for myself it's a way to pass the time it's something i enjoy doing if i have free time it's something i like to do and uh yeah if i didn't enjoy it i have no reason to continue doing it okay and what about you michelle how do you how do you stay focused on such a such a long work which uh, by the way moves like lightning <laughs> i won't uh, a lot of that is due to um to wise counsel from my, my uh, editor bethany gibson um i take a lot longer i have to, uh i work a full-time job so um i i i usually write something every day i get up early in the mornings when, when my illness allows and i i usually write on um spend most of my weekends working on something uh i i've been in radio for for years, mostly as a copywriter. And that's actually been very helpful to me because it doesn't matter if I'm in the mood to write a commercial, it needs to be done, so I do it. So I've been able to take that and and, and apply it to my fiction. Uh, it's, it's a job, it's a calling. Uh, if I don't work on something, I get very, very grumpy and my husband will assure you I'm very difficult to live with. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Are there, are there pieces of writing ad copy that inform i mean besides you know the absolute discipline of it like there's a real tightness in in these scenes that you create like they move very quickly and they're you know they're just so taut it, do you think that might come from is there anything that comes from ad copy or is it complete chalk and cheese uh they're very different disciplines but uh one um i write most of the commercials i write are 30 seconds so it's got it's got to be very brief it's got to it's got to be immediate Okay. So yeah, I think it helps. I, uh, we have a question from Max Abbott who asks, um, I was wondering, what would you say to a historian who, tr who tr struggles to read historical fiction, even though I was very impressed with the research in this book? Yes, I am too. Ah, struggles to read historical fiction. I will, well, first, I'd love to know why. Is it because um, you, you f is it because you, you feel the author is playing fast and loose with something you know to be firm and true? Um, is it because the fiction seems sloppy to you? Um, I yeah, I'd I, I, I'd ask you why first. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that we're just about done here. Would you say, Jeff? Yeah, I'd say we've uh, we've made good time here. We've okay. got to the end. Um, I had a wonderful time sitting in and listening to both readings and the discussion. It was such a joy. Um, uh, when you say, Lisa, I have. I think it's fantastic, and I've been working my way through these books, and both of them are just so compelling, and uh, you know, in places charming and and deep. Uh, so I, I really recommend that you guys go out and get them uh, at once. <laughs> but uh, I, as I said, I think goosling.com is, is a great way to go during the pandemic. You just, uh, you know, get on the internet and it comes very quickly. Um, but it's also at local bookstores, which is important to, uh, to support your local bookstore as well. And I really want to say thank you uh, to Jeff for inviting me and thank you both Tyler and Michelle for this beautiful evening and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for hosting both of you. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations, Michelle. Thank you, Tyler. Congratulations.